All right. So what I'm going to do is continue on with a, along the same vein. I, I preached a sermon a couple weeks ago on the prophecies fulfilled in the Bible. And those prophecies all had to do with um, various events that happened, usually in the Old Testament, and hundreds of years would go by, and then it would be fulfilled. And it's really neat get, seeing all these various events take place. And uh, what I'm going to focus on this morning, though, is... All the prophecies, not, well, not all the prophecies, let's put it this way, a few of the prophecies that deal with Jesus Christ, from his birth to his ministry to his crucifixion, his death, his burial, his resurrection, how all of this was prophesied in the Old Testament, how we see a picture painted, and um, even the people of the day knew that they were looking for a, uh, a Messiah. And they knew a few things regarding Jesus Christ. And the reason why they knew that is because it was already written in Scripture. So um, let's dig into this right away. Uh, turn, if you would, keep your finger in Matthew 1. I'm going to show you the Old Testament prophecy of this in Isaiah chapter 7. And just to give you an example of what I was just referring to, because it wasn't in my notes, but in John chapter 4 is a story of the woman at the well. And Jesus is speaking to this Samaritan woman. And, you know, he, he's, he's basically preaching the gospel unto her. He's, he's preaching unto her. He's telling her, you know, um, a little bit about God. And then, it's a, and then she responds to him and says, The woman saith unto him, I know that Messiah cometh, which is called Christ, when he is come, he will tell us all things. So the people at that time were looking for a savior. They were looking for a Messiah. They were looking for the Christ. It is something that they had understood. They had, they had already gotten that from Scripture, from all the Old Testament, from the Law of Moses to the Prophets, the Psalms, everything. Everything in the Old Testament is pointing to Jesus Christ. And what we're going to do this morning now is look at some very specific examples that the Bible is very clearly stating, you know, hundreds of years earlier before Jesus Christ was born, that these things were going to happen. And what's amazing about it is how they happen exactly the way that they're written. Now, it's not that amazing when you consider we have an amazing God, when, when God is capable of doing anything, of course, but it, it shows the fingerprint of God. It shows that these are definitely from God, and it shows that Jesus Christ is the Messiah. So, Matthew 1, we read the entire chapter, but at the end of that chapter there, starting in verse number 18, the Bible reads, Now the birth of Jesus Christ was on this wise, when, as his mother Mary was espoused to Joseph, before they came together, she was found with child of the Holy Ghost. Then Joseph, her husband, being a just man and not willing to make her a public example, was minded to put her away privily. But while he thought on these things, behold, the angel of the Lord appeared unto him in a dream, saying, Joseph, thou son of David, fear not to take unto thee Mary thy wife, for that which is conceived in her is of the Holy Ghost." And she shall bring forth a son, and thou shalt call his name Jesus, for he shall save his people from their sins. So what this is explaining is that um, you know, the birth of Jesus Christ happened like this, verse 18. And Mary and Joseph were espoused to each other. They were married to each other, but they had not consummated the marriage yet. And um, it says, before they came together, she was found with child. So she's pregnant, right? And, you, and Joseph's thinking, well, she cheated on me, right? I mean, we're espoused and she's pregnant. He's like, there's only one way that I know of that a person's going to get pregnant. So he's thinking, okay, I'm going to divorce her. I'm going to put her away. And that's why I said Joseph being a just man, it would have been justified. It would have been right. This is the situation in which it is acceptable in the law of God, law of Moses, in order to get a divorce was... They had not consummated the marriage yet, but she was found to, to, to you know, be unclean or to have committed fornication or whatever because she's with child. So he was going to put her away. And he said put her away privily. So he's not going to make a big public example of it. He's just going to say, okay, well, I just, you know, we're not going to get married. Just kind of put her away privately. But um, 
of course, the, the pregnancy was a result of God and the, whole, you know, the Holy Ghost coming upon her and that child being conceived miraculously, not through any normal means. So, he's, you know, God, an angel of the Lord appears unto Joseph saying, you know, hey, you actually don't have to worry about this. This is, this is the Holy Ghost and uh, she's going to bring forth a son and you're going to call his name Jesus. And um, it's a pretty amazing event. But just showing us here, just you know, a little bit of detail on what happens with, this, with the virgin woman who is having a child. Now look at verse 22. It says, Now all this was done that it might be fulfilled, which was spoken of the Lord by the prophet, saying, Behold, a virgin shall be with child and shall bring forth a son, and they shall call his name Emmanuel, which being interpreted is God with us. Then Joseph, being raised from sleep, did as the angel of the Lord had bidden him, and took unto him his wife, and knew her not, till she had brought forth her firstborn son, and he called his name Jesus. So he, he, he retained her as a wife, but he still, they did not have any physical relation until after the child was born. That there is absolutely no way to say that this was not a miraculous birth, that it was not um, conceived in any way by him, that he was not the physical father of this child. And Isaiah chapter 7 is where this prophecy comes from. Isaiah 7, verse 14, the Bible says, Therefore the Lord himself shall give you a sign. Behold, a virgin shall conceive and bear a son and shall call his name Emmanuel. Butter and honey shall he eat that he may know to refuse the evil and choose the good. And again, this was written by the prophet Isaiah way back, way prior to, to Jesus Christ being born. And this was the sign. He's saying, okay, here's a sign. There's going to be a virgin that's going to give birth. And um, you say, well, how do we know she was a virgin, right? Well, physically, you're, you're not going to know that other than what's written in the Bible, right? But we, we're, you know, we're gathered here this morning as believers in God's word. And really, the point of the sermon isn't to convent, convince the person who doesn't believe on Jesus and doesn't believe in the Bible, it's to magnify the awesomeness and excellence of, of God and to show how, how amazing this is. And again, it, it, it does prove um, how well everything goes together. I mean, this, these, are, these are things that, it's not like, if I put it this way, it's not like the religion of worshiping the Lord or Jehovah, you know, before Christ was born was some insignificant small cult religion this was a big deal i mean this was this was scripture that has been followed by a, a group of people a, a significant large significantly large group of people for a long time these scriptures have been i mean this is historical fact these scriptures have been around for a long time and have been adhered to have been followed you know since the time of moses and beyond Okay, when God led out the children of Egypt with a strong arm, a mighty hand, and he brought them through with all those miracles, and people saw the awesome power of the Lord and began to receive the written word of God, the scriptures have been studied, they've been followed, they've been adhered to, you know, as best as people can, and... and were, were looked at and to the point to where the people are still looking, they believe the scriptures, looking for a Messiah, you cannot just throw this stuff away when we have a record and an account of a man, Jesus Christ, being born and fitting in to all of the various prophecies that were written just, just years and years prior. And there's, I mean, there, these are things that you can't just fake. You can't just make up. You say, well, maybe they faked the virgin birth. Well, we're going to keep on going if that's not enough for you. Um, turn, if you would, to Micah chapter 5. And this is one of those sermons that you might want to take notes. We've got that section on the back of our bulletin to be able to take notes in the sermon because I'm going to try to get through these as quick as I can. We're kind of going in order of Jesus' life and the fulfillment of the prophecies is the way that I, that I organize the sermon. We're going to look at Micah 5 and compare that with Matthew 2. So you're always going to want to keep one finger in the New Testament and one in the Old. We're going to be looking at a lot of uh, scripture from Psalms and Isaiah and Zechariah mostly. And then um, Matt, you know, the Gospels pretty much for mostly in Matthew for, for the fulfillment of these scriptures. So if you're in Micah chapter 5, 
Verse number one, the Bible reads, Now gather thyself in troops, O daughter of troops. He hath laid siege against us. They shall smite the judge of Israel with a rod upon the cheek. But thou, Bethlehem Ephrathah, though thou be little among the thousands of Judah, yet out of thee shall he come forth unto me, that is to be ruler in Israel, whose goings forth have been from of old, from everlasting. So we see here clearly talking about God, talking about Jesus Christ coming to rule because it says that his goings forth have been of old, which means you know, where he came from is from everlasting. He's been around forever. The fact that God was going to become flesh and come to this earth to be Christ, to be the Messiah, was known and prophesied back in the Old Testament. This is Micah preaching and teaching that he's going to be coming, the ruler of Israel, and he's going to come from Bethlehem. Right. Now, as we look at some of these scriptures, you can start to understand a little bit, too, if you're familiar with the New Testament, their perception of Jesus Christ and what everybody thought was going to happen was that Jesus Christ was going to set up his kingdom at his first coming. That was their understanding of the Old Testament. It was, it, was, it was mixed up. But when you read the Old Testament, you can understand because the Old Testament is more like looking through a glass darkly. There's a lot of things that have not been come to light yet. And there's parts of the scripture that, um, you know, for one, there's dual references. And there's also, um, it's just not quite as clear. It's a little bit more cryptic. But when you start to see it, you know, as the New Testament unfolds, as Jesus Christ comes on the scene, as he teaches them, as he expounds and opens up the scripture to them, then it becomes clear, oh, okay, this is what you're saying. This is what you're teaching. He's not setting up his kingdom yet. The Old Testament is full of prophecies going all the way to the end of the world. And what was happening is they were kind of condensing that into, into one prophecy, not realizing there's actually two um, two comings of Jesus Christ. One when he comes the first time, which, he, which has already happened, and then when he comes back again the second time. Now, we see here it's saying specifically that he's going to come out of Bethlehem. And then in Matthew, Matthew 2, verse number 1, the Bible reads, Now when Jesus was born in Bethlehem of Judea in the days of Herod the king, behold, there came wise men from the east to Jerusalem. So the wise men were coming to see Jesus Christ. They are wise they're wise in the scriptures. They're coming to find Jesus Christ. He was born in Bethlehem of Judea. And they're looking to find that, uh, that Messiah. And this is actually, it's kind of interesting. This is one of the sticking points for a lot of the Pharisees and the Sadducees, right? When they're trying to prove whether or not this is the Christ, even though he's performing all these miracles and doing all the great thing, he's preaching the word of God. They were saying, oh, you're from Galilee, right? Because most of his childhood was spent growing up in Galilee, but that's not where he was born. He was born in Bethlehem. And again, fulfilling this prophecy. And then another prophecy he fulfilled. Let's turn, if you would, to, you're in Matthew 2. You can just stay in Matthew 2. I'll read from you from Hosea, Hosea 11, 1. You can write that down if you want to look it up later. Hosea 11, 1. The Bible reads, when Israel was a child, then I loved him and called my son out of Egypt. And this is where in Matthew 2, if you go to Matthew 2, look at verse number 13. We see a little bit more about the story of Jesus Christ's birth. He was born in Bethlehem. But when he was young, Herod wanted to destroy Jesus Christ because he saw him as a threat to his kingdom. He, he knew, he had heard that, hey, there's going to be this Jewish person that's born that's going to be, you know, set up a kingdom and he didn't want anything to do with it. And he actually was fearful enough to say, you know what, I'll take care of this. We'll just wipe out every child that's two years old and under to try to make sure that he kills, just kills off any chance that Jesus Christ might be alive. And in Matthew 2.13, we see that here. And um, it says, And when they were departed, behold, the angel of the Lord appeareth to Joseph in a dream, saying, Arise, and take the young child and his mother, and flee into Egypt, and be thou there until I bring thee word, for Herod will seek the young child to destroy him. When he arose, he took the young child and his mother by night and departed into Egypt and was there until the death of Herod, that it might be fulfilled, which was spoken of the Lord by the prophet, saying, Out of Egypt have I called my son. So again, in, in Old Testament reference, just this, this, this it's, a, it's a smaller passage, but 
calling God's son, calling his son out of Egypt. So he had to go into Egypt. Why did he have to go into Egypt? Because of Herod, because of that wicked ruler. So these are things that were like everything that happens in the fulfillment of prophecy, you're going to also notice it makes sense that it happened. Like there was a good reason for it. It wasn't just someone coming to try to um, make sure they could, they could check off a list of all of these various prophecies to make sure that we could make somebody try to fit this thing that, that people in the Old Testament have written and we could just try to, to, to make this work somehow so that we don't look like liars. I mean, it's been hundreds of years and, and the Messiah hasn't come yet, so let's just make somebody, you know, make up this big conspiracy to get somebody to fit all these various prophecies. That's not the way it happened at all. You can see very good reasons for this. When, hey, I don't know about you, but if, if, if I heard about someone who's going to try to kill all the children you know, at a certain age range, and I had one in that range, I'm going to get out of there too. That's right. And that's what happened with Jesus. They were protecting Jesus, and of all places, they went to Egypt. They went to Egypt to flee. And when Herod was dead, when, when they didn't have to worry about that problem anymore, they were called back. So out of Egypt... I have called my son. Jesus comes back out of Egypt. He was born in Bethlehem. He comes back out of Egypt, spends time growing up in Galilee. Now, um, turn, if you would, to Isaiah chapter 35. Isaiah 35. I'm not going to show you all the New Testament references for this, but we're going to see prophecies of the ministry of Jesus Christ. There are too many to turn to in the New Testament to show you proof of this. We're going to see how Jesus, um, you know, all of the miracles that he performed and the healings of people were also prophesied. Anyone who's read the New Testament is well aware, especially in the four Gospels, you're well aware of all the various times that Jesus Christ was healing the sick and making the, the lame to walk, and opening up the eyes of the blind, and opening up the ears of the deaf. I mean, this, was, this is recorded. This is one of the big events. Why he couldn't even enter into some cities because so many people thronged him and because they were bringing out people to be healed. I mean, this is what he was known for in his ministry, is going and serving people, preaching the word of God, and healing people, bringing that healing power. Isaiah chapter 35 Look at verse number 4. Isaiah 35, verse number 4. Say to them that are of a fearful heart, Be strong, fear not. Behold, your God will come with vengeance, even God with a recompense. He will come and save you. Then the eyes of the blind shall be opened, and the ears of the deaf shall be unstopped. Then shall the lame man leap as in heart, and the tongue of the dumb sing. For in the wilderness shall waters break out in streams and deserts. So it's talking here about God coming with a vengeance and coming with a recompense, and he's going to come and save you. Jesus came to bring salvation to the world. And he came in power. He came with the miracles of God. He came and literally opened up the eyes of the blind. I mean, the people that, that, that hated him and thought he was a heretic and wanted to destroy him could not deny the miracles that he performed. They're saying, look, that a great miracle has been performed, we can't deny this. So what are we going to do about this? Well, we're just going to have to threaten him and try to get him to shut up and kick him out and conspire to kill him. That's all we can do. Because they couldn't do it. And the fame of Jesus Christ went abroad as he started healing the sick. He started opening up the ears of the deaf. I mean, if a man had been blind from birth, when disciples said, you know, who did sin here, this man or his parents? Because he was born blind. And Jesus said, neither, basically. He's saying that he didn't sin. He says, but for the glory of God. And he healed him there, and he, and he opened up the eyes of the blind, and he was able to see. Events that no one has ever been able to do. To this day, people aren't able to do that. We have a lot of technology these days. There's a lot of things, there's a lot of really cool technologies, and there's a lot of you know, people being helped with advanced hearing aids and things like this, and even, you know, to brain stimulation. All various things are being done, but nothing like Jesus done is still able to be done, no matter how much technology we have today, is, is able to do all the things that Jesus was able to do. Turn if you to Isaiah 42, just, just a few chapters forward. We see another prophecy of Jesus Christ, again, along the same lines. 
of his ministry and just and just showing that this is what the Christ is going to be doing. This is how we're going to know who he is. In the, in the New Testament, the Bible says these are many infallible proofs. It means you cannot prove them wrong. They're infallible. They're untouchable. It's, it's, it's something that happened and they're irrefutable. You cannot deny that these things happened. Um, and that's how, you know, one of the ways that Jesus proved he was the Messiah, that he was God in the flesh and fulfilled these scriptures. I mean, you want to say the virgin birth was, oh, well, that was, they were just trying to, to fulfill scriptures and build, you know, and build up him to be something he wasn't. Well, when you start getting to the point of his ministry, you're going to have a hard time trying, trying to refute what he did. And, and trying to, you know, if this was all a conspiracy to just try to make some Old Testament scriptures true, you're going to have some mass deception going on to the scale that, is, that has never been known ever since that time. And you mean to tell me, you know, the people say, oh, we're so smart and those people were so dumb. Oh, two, you, you, you read a 2,000 year old book. Oh, is that where you're going to get all your wisdom from? Those people were dumb. They didn't even have plumbing. They didn't, you know, you hear all these stupid arguments and saying how extremely dumb these people were. Yeah, but they pulled off the greatest fraud in history of getting people to believe that people who are blind are actually receiving their sight and people who are deaf are actually able to hear and people who are sick and lame and not able to walk are all of a sudden jumping up and able to walk again. Yeah, that, that stupid group of people somehow just pulled off the greatest fraud in history that no one has ever been able to mimic or, or duplicate ever one time throughout all of history. Right. Isaiah 42, look at verse number one. Behold my servant whom I uphold, mine elect in whom my soul delighteth. I have put my spirit upon him. He shall bring forth judgment to the Gentiles. He shall not cry, nor lift up, nor cause his voice to be heard in the street. A bruised reed shall he not break, and the smoking flax shall he not quench. He shall bring forth judgment unto truth. He shall not fail, nor be discouraged till he have set judgment in the earth and the isles shall wait for his law. Thus saith God the Lord, he that created the heavens and stretched them out, he that spread forth the earth in that which, in that which cometh out of it, he that giveth breath unto the people upon it and spirit to them that walk therein. I the Lord have called thee in righteousness and will hold thine hand and will keep thee and give thee for a covenant of the people, for a light of the Gentiles, to open the blind eyes, to bring out the prisoners from the prison, and them that sit in darkness out of the prison house. Again, showing that he's opening up the eyes of the blind, freeing the prisoners, and, and, and giving people salvation, shedding light to this world. Um, turn, if you would, to Zechariah chapter 9. Zechariah 9, and then we're going to look at Matthew 21. And this is just, mind you, this is a sampling of the prophecies that are fulfilled. Just keep that in mind as we're going through all these various scriptures this morning. This is not comprehensive. I just kind of dabbled and touched with the various aspects of Jesus' life from birth unto death, unto resurrection, rather just to, to, to show you how awesome this is and, and to glorify the name of God and, and his perfection and being able to fulfill everything that's been, that's been already written previously. Look at Zechariah chapter 9, and then we're going to go to Matthew 21 for the fulfillment of this. Zechariah 9, 9, Rejoice greatly, O daughter of Zion. Shout, O daughter of Jerusalem. Behold, thy king... And again, a lot of these Old Testament references are talk about the king and a ruler and someone, you know, this is the Christ. This is the Messiah. This is who they're looking for. Behold, thy king cometh unto, me, unto thee. He is just and having salvation, lowly and riding upon an ass and upon a colt, the foal of an ass. You say your ruler is going to come, but he's going to be humble. He's going to be meek. He's going to be so humble. He's, he's riding on the foal of an ass. Right? Not some grand entrance that you would think of the king of kings and lord of lords coming. You know, he says, no, you're king. He's bringing salvation. He's going to be meek. He's going to be lowly. And he's just going to be coming in on an ass. 
Matthew 21. Matthew 21, this is Jesus' entry in Jerusalem. Look at verse number 2. Matthew 21, verse number 2, saying unto them, Go into the village over against you, and straightway ye shall find an ass tied and a colt with her. Loose them and bring them unto me. And if any man say aught unto you, ye shall say, The Lord hath need of them, and straightway he will send them. Now, th th this is just amazing in and of itself. Jesus knows the scripture. Jesus knows what he needs to do. Jesus knows everything he needs to fulfill, everything that's been laid out for him to do, and he's fulfilling everything to a T. He knows these things. He's not ignorant of these things. But he's bringing this to pass. He's saying, you know what? Go, here's where you're going to find this colt tied. Go over there, get it, and if anyone says anything to you, just say the Lord has need of him. You know, it's not even his. I mean, it's just someone else's cult. He said, go lose some, and if anyone stops you and asks you, just, you know what, say the Lord has need of him. And this is exactly what happened. They go to loose the colt, and some guys are standing there going, hey, what are you doing? <laughs> and they go, the Lord has need of him. And they're like, okay, go ahead. <laughs> and they let him go. I mean, it's, it's amazing. And he bring him back. Look at verse 4. All this was done that it might be fulfilled, which was spoken by the prophet, saying, Tell you the daughter of Zion, behold, thy king cometh unto thee, meek and sitting upon an ass, and a colt the foal of an ass. And the disciples went and did as Jesus commanded them, and brought the ass and the colt, and put on them their clothes, and they set him thereon. And a very great multitude spread their garments in the way. Others cut down branches from the trees and strawed them in the way. And the multitudes that went before and that followed cried, saying, Hosanna to the Son of David. Blessed is he that cometh in the name of the Lord. Hosanna in the highest. Now again, you could say, oh, you're picking apart the Old Testament just trying to make all these various things fit. Well, who else are you going to be able to find? Even if you're just saying you're trying to pull apart all these various things and make this fit here and there. It's pretty uncanny how you could find all of these, and we're, we're still going through this, all of these places in Scripture that just so seemingly fit perfectly. Because it's not a coincidence. You're in Matthew 21, flip back to Matthew chapter 8. Jesus himself prophesied of his own death and burial and resurrection. Not even all of the prophecies from the Old Testament, but it, excuse me, I, did, I have you, did I say Mark? I said, I meant to say Math, or, I, I meant to say Mark. Mark chapter 8. So we go forward from Matthew 21 to Mark 8. Mark chapter 8, verse 31. By reason, he began to teach them that the Son of Man must suffer many things and be rejected of the elders and of the chief priests and scribes and be killed and after three days rise again. This was still early in his ministry in Mark chapter 8. This was early on in the work that he was doing. He's already telling them, saying, look, this is what's going to happen. I'm going to suffer many things. I'm going to be rejected. I'm going to, you know, the chief priests, all these people in power, they're all going to reject me. I'm going to be killed. But after three days, I'm going to rise again from the dead. And they didn't understand that until after the resurrection, but um, he taught them that prior to his own death, burial, and resurrection. Turn, if you would, to Zechariah chapter 11. And we're also going to look at Matthew 27. Zechariah 11. We're going to see now the betrayal of Jesus Christ. Because that also was prophesied. The, the entire story of Jesus Christ was prophesied. We saw his birth being prophesied. We saw his ministry and his works being prophesied. We saw his entry into Jerusalem being prophesied prior to his crucifixion. Now we're going to see the betrayal of Jesus Christ being prophesied. Just in one place. There's, there's, there's others. There's many others, by the way. Like, I mean, all of these. We're looking at one in Zechariah chapter 11, verse number 2. Bible reason, I said unto them, If ye think good, give me my price, and if not, forbear. So they weighed for my price thirty pieces of silver. And the Lord said unto me, Cast it unto the potter, a goodly price that I was prized out of them. And I took the thirty pieces of silver and cast them to the potter in the house of the Lord. And here he's talking about the price, the price of a man. They valued him at 30 pieces of silver. Go, if you would, to Matthew 27. This is what Judas Iscariot was hired for, to deliver Jesus Christ. Basically, the price of the blood of Jesus Christ was 30 pieces of silver. That's what they, that's what they valued 
the betrayal of Jesus at delivering Jesus Christ into their hands, the price of a man, 30 pieces of silver. Matthew 27, verse number 5, And he cast down the pieces of silver in the temple and departed and went and hanged himself. And the chief priest took the silver pieces and said, It is not lawful for to put them into the treasury because it is the price of blood. And they took counsel and bought with them the potter's field to bury strangers therein. Wherefore that field was called the field of blood unto this day. Then was fulfilled that which was spoken by Jeremy the prophet, saying, and they took the 30 pieces of silver, the price of him that was valued, whom they of the children of Israel did value, and gave, for them, and gave them for the potter's field as the Lord appointed me. You say, well, wait a minute. You know, this says that which was spoken by Jeremy the prophet, but we looked at Zechariah. Well, he says not that which was written in the book of Zechariah, but that was spoken by Jer Jer Jeremiah. If you, at this time in the Old Testament, this is a whole other subject, but... Zechariah, Jeremiah, a lot of these prophets were all around during the same period of time anyways, and they're all preaching various things, and just because something's recorded in one book doesn't mean that it wasn't spoken by another prophet, and um, even if it's not recorded in the book of Jeremiah, it says here that it was spoken of Jeremiah. I just wanted to, to mention that in case uh, you were confused about that, but um, we see here again, it's no, you know, it's talking about the potter and giving the, the silver for the potter, and then they bought the potter's field with uh, with that thirty pieces of silver that Jesus was um, priced at. Let's turn now to the book of Psalms. Turn to Psalm twenty-two. Psalm twenty-two and Matthew twenty-seven. So if you keep your place in Matthew twenty-seven, and we're gonna flip back and forth between Psalm twenty-two and Matthew twenty-seven. Now we're going to look at the crucifixion of Jesus Christ and the, the prophecies on, on that wise. Matthew, or excuse me, Psalm 22, starting in verse number 1. The Bible reads, My God, my God, why hast thou forsaken me? Why art thou so far from helping me and from the words of my roaring? Very familiar words we see in Matthew 27, 46, Jesus Christ saying the same exact phrase. And about the ninth hour, Jesus cried with loud voice saying, Eli, Eli, lama sabachthani, which, that is to say, my God, my God, why hast thou forsaken me? Let's keep reading in Psalm, Psalm uh, verse number five, Psalm 22, verse five. They cried unto thee and were delivered. They trusted in thee and were not confounded. But I am a worm and no man, a reproach of men and despised of the people. All they that see me laugh me to scorn. They shoot out the lip. They shake the head saying he trusted on the Lord that he would deliver him. Let him deliver him seeing he delighteth in him. This is what's recorded as being said about Jesus. This is what's being recorded in Psalm 22, a songbook about the Savior that, you know, he said, I'm, I'm a reproach, I'm a worm, I'm despised, people hate me, they're mocking me, they're ridiculing me. And this is prophesied about other people. This isn't even Jesus Christ himself, you know, himself, you know, uh, um, doing the, the fulfillment in this sense, right? When people are, are speaking of him, let's look at Matthew 27, starting in verse number 39. You'll see what I'm talking about. As Jesus was on the cross in Matthew 27, 39, and they that passed by reviled him, wagging their heads and saying, Thou that destroyest the temple and buildest it in three days, save thyself if thou be the Son of God. Come down from the cross. Likewise also the chief priests, mocking him with the scribes and elders, said, He saved others, himself he cannot save. If he be the king of Israel, let him now come down from the cross and we will believe him. So they're mocking him. They're ridiculing him. They're despising Jesus Christ up there and just making fun of him. But look at verse number 43. This is what they said. He trusted in God. Let him deliver him now if he will have him. For he said, I am the son of God. Matches up exactly with Psalm 22, 8. He trusted on the Lord that he would deliver him. Let him deliver him, seeing he delighteth in him. The Bible prophesied that that's what they'd be saying. And the account of Matthew says that they said those same exact things. They said it. Right. 
of Jesus Christ fulfilling this prophecy unwittingly. They probably didn't even realize that they were fulfilling Scripture as they were saying and mocking and ridiculing Jesus Christ. Yet it happened. It happened to a T. Look at, go back to Psalm 22. Look at verse number 13. They gaped upon me with their mouths as a ravening and a roaring lion. I am poured out like water and all my bones are out of joint. My heart is like wax. It is melted in the midst of my bowels. My strength is dried up like a potsherd and my tongue cleaveth to my jaws. And thou hast brought me into the dust of death. For dogs have compassed me. The assembly of the wicked have enclosed me. They pierced my hands and my feet. Again, very powerful prophecy here saying, you know, how all his bones are out of joint, bowels are dried up. He said, my tongue, you know, he's, he's so thirsty that his tongue is just sticking to the roof of his mouth. And he says, they pierced his hands and his feet. People will get executed in various ways. Different things happen to people, but to have your hands and your feet pierced, again, it, is, is, it brings the group of, of potential saviors, messiahs, to a small number of people. He says, I may tell all my bones. They look and stare upon me. He was beaten so bad and whipped so bad he could literally see his bones. They part my garments among them and cast lots upon my vesture. Again, Psalm 22. Back during the time of the reign of King David, prior to them, prior to all of the kings of Israel, prior to them being led captive into, into Babylon, prior to them coming back from captivity, rebuilding the temple, continuing on, being taken over by the Romans, prior to all of that stuff, this was prophesied. All of these events were spoken. They were written down. They were sung as hymns as psalms. And what happens? Look at verse 35 of Matthew 27. And they crucified him. It means they nailed him. They nailed through his hands and his feet to that cross and parted his garments, casting lots that it might be fulfilled, which was spoken by the prophet. They parted my garments among them and upon my vesture did they cast lots. They wanted his clothing. So they, they, they gambled for it, whatever. They cast lots and, and decided who was going to get it so they didn't have to, to break, you know, rip it up and to ruin it. I don't know if that was a regular occurrence when people got crucified, but it definitely happened in this case and it definitely fulfilled this scripture. And we see the thirst of Jesus Christ. We see him saying, I thirst, and them giving him vinegar to drink instead of giving him some water. They see him, you know, ridicule him and mocking him and, and everything that Jesus Christ went through, all of this came fulfilled to a T and was witnessed by many people and recorded and written down. Turn if you would to, um, turn if you would to Isaiah 53. I'm just going to read for you from Zechariah 12. Zechariah 12.10 says, And I will pour upon the house of David and upon the inhabitants of Jerusalem the spirit of grace and of supplications, and they shall look upon me whom they have pierced, and they shall mourn for him as one mourneth for his only son, and shall be in bitterness for him as one that is in bitterness for his firstborn. Again, the piercing of Jesus Christ prophesied in Zechariah 12. Isaiah 53, we're going to see more prophecies of Jesus Christ's crucifixion. Isaiah 53, verse number 1. Who hath believed our report, and to whom is the arm of the Lord revealed? For he shall grow up before him as a tender plant, and as a root out of a dry ground, he hath no form nor comeliness, and when we shall see him, there is no beauty that we should desire him. He is despised and rejected of men, a man of sorrows and acquainted with grief, and we hid, as it were, our faces from him. He was despised and we esteemed him not. How can you esteem someone that you're shouting, crucify him? crucify him, right? Of course they didn't esteem him. Of course he was despised. Of course he was rejected. That's exactly, this is what happened to Jesus Christ. Look at verse number four. Surely he hath borne our griefs and carried our sorrows, yet we did esteem him stricken, smitten of God, and afflicted. But he was wounded for our transgressions. He was bruised for our iniquities, the chastisement of our peace was upon him, and with his stripes we are healed. And we see the recording of Jesus Christ was whipped. He was beaten. He, was, he had stripes left 
from being whipped and beaten. He was wounded. He was bruised. Verse 6, all we like sheep have gone astray. We have turned everyone to his own way. And the Lord hath laid on him the iniquity of us all. He was oppressed and he was afflicted, yet he opened not his mouth. He is brought as a lamb to the slaughter and as a sheep before her shearers is dumb, so he openeth not his mouth. You remember when they were charging him and they were bringing accusations against him. What did Jesus do? He said nothing. He remained silent. I mean, he said one or two phrases, just, but, but he wasn't answering for himself. He wasn't defending himself. He wasn't trying to get out of anything. He just, he allowed it to happen. He let everything proceed and go forth. As a sheep before his shears is dumb, so he opened not his mouth. He knew this needed to happen. He didn't try to put up a fight or a defense. He just went along with it. Verse number eight, he was taken from prison and from judgment. And who shall declare his generation? For he was cut off out of the land of the living. For the transgression of my people was he stricken. And he made his grave with the wicked and with the rich in his death because he had done no violence. Neither was there any deceit in his mouth. Yet it pleased the Lord to bruise him. He hath put him to grief. When thou shalt make his soul an offering for sin, he shall see his seed. He shall prolong his days and the pleasure of the Lord shall prosper in his hand. He shall see of the travail of his soul and shall be satisfied by his knowledge. Excuse me. By his knowledge shall my righteous servant justify many, for he shall bear their iniquities. Therefore will I divide him a portion with the great, and he shall divide the spoil with the strong, because he hath poured out his soul unto death and was numbered with the transgressors. And he bare the sin of many and made intercession for the transgressors. He was numbered with the transgressors. He was crucified with two thieves. So he was counted being condemned with them. They were transgressors. He was not. But he was numbered with them. And it says he made intercession for the transgressors. Remember he said, um, Lord, forgive them. They know not what they do. And you also remember when the one thief you know, spake unto him and, and he finally put his faith on Jesus. And, you know, at first he was reviling him in his lips. And then he says, you know what? We're in this situation and, and rightfully so because we're thieves, we're criminals. But this man hasn't done anything. And he said, Lord, remember me when thou comest into that kingdom. And Jesus said, this day shalt thou be with me in paradise. He made intercession for the truth. All of these things, it's, uh, you were confused about that. But um, we see her again. It's no, you know, it's talking about the potter and giving the, the silver for the potter, and then they bought the potter's field with uh, with that thirty pieces of silver that Jesus was um, priced at. Let's turn now to the book of Psalms. Turn to Psalm twenty-two. Psalm twenty-two and Matthew twenty-seven. So if you keep your place in Matthew twenty-seven, and we're gonna flip back and forth between Psalm twenty-two and Matthew twenty-seven. Now we're going to look at the crucifixion of Jesus Christ and the, the prophecies on, on that wise. Matthew, or excuse me, Psalm 22, starting in verse number one. The Bible reads, My God, my God, why hast thou forsaken me? Why art thou so far from helping me and from the words of my roaring? Very familiar words we see in Matthew 27, 46, Jesus Christ saying the same exact phrase. And about the ninth hour, Jesus cried with loud voice saying, Eli, Eli, lama sabachthani, which, that is to say, my God, my God, why hast thou forsaken me? Let's keep reading in Psalm, Psalm uh, verse number five, Psalm 22, verse five. They cried unto thee and were delivered. They trusted in thee and were not confounded. But I am a worm and no man, a reproach of men and despised of the people. All they that see me laugh me to scorn. They shoot out the lip. They shake the head saying he trusted on the Lord that he would deliver him. Let him deliver him seeing he delighteth in him. This is what's recorded as being said about Jesus. This is what's being recorded in Psalm 22, a songbook about the Savior that, you know, he said, I'm, I'm a reproach, I'm a worm, I'm despised, people hate me, they're mocking me, they're ridiculing me. 
And this is prophesied about other people. This isn't even Jesus Christ himself, you know, himself, you know, uh, um, doing the, the fulfillment in this sense, right? When people are, are speaking of him, let's look at Matthew 27, starting in verse number 39. You'll see what I'm talking about. As Jesus was on the cross in Matthew 27, 39, and they that passed by reviled him, wagging their heads and saying, Thou that destroyest the temple and buildest it in three days, save thyself if thou be the Son of God. Come down from the cross. Likewise also the chief priests, mocking him with the scribes and elders, said, He saved others, himself he cannot save. If he be the king of Israel, let him now come down from the cross, and we will believe him. So they're mocking him, they're ridiculing him, they're despising Jesus Christ up there and just making fun of him. But look at verse number 43. This is what they said. He trusted in God. Let him deliver him now if he will have him. For he said, I am the son of God. Matches up exactly with Psalm 22, 8. He trusted on the Lord that he would deliver him. Let him deliver him, seeing he delighteth in him. The Bible prophesied that that's what they'd be saying. And the account of Matthew says that they said those same exact things. They said it. Right. Of Jesus Christ. Fulfilling this prophecy unwittingly. They probably didn't even realize that they were fulfilling scripture as they were saying and mocking and ridiculing Jesus Christ. Yet it happened. It happened to a T. Look at, go back to Psalm 22. Look at verse number 13. They gaped upon me with their mouths as a ravening and a roaring lion. I am poured out like water and all my bones are out of joint. My heart is like wax. It is melted in the midst of my bowels. My strength is dried up like a potsherd and my tongue cleaveth to my jaws. And thou hast brought me into the dust of death. For dogs have compassed me. The assembly of the wicked have enclosed me. They pierced my hands and my feet. Again, very powerful prophecy here saying, you know, how all his bones are out of joint, bowels are dried up. He said, my tongue, you know, he's, he's so thirsty that his tongue is just sticking to the roof of his mouth. And he says, they pierced his hands and his feet. People will get executed in various ways. Different things happen to people, but to have your hands and your feet pierced, again, it, is, is, it brings the group of, of potential saviors, messiahs, to a small number of people. He says, I may tell all my bones. They look and stare upon me. He was beaten so bad and whipped so bad he could literally see his bones. They part my garments among them and cast lots upon my vesture. Again, Psalm 22. Back during the time of the reign of King David, prior to them, prior to all of the kings of Israel, prior to them being led captive into, into Babylon, prior to them coming back from captivity, rebuilding the temple, continuing on, being taken over by the Romans, prior to all of that stuff, this was prophesied. All of these events were spoken. They were written down. They were sung as hymns as psalms. And what happens? Look at verse 35 of Matthew 27. And they crucified him. It means they nailed him. They nailed through his hands and his feet to that cross and parted his garments, casting lots, that it might be fulfilled, which was spoken by the prophet. They parted my garments among them, and upon my vesture did they cast lots. They wanted his clothing. So they, they, they gambled for it, whatever. They cast lots and, and decided who was going to get it so they didn't have to, to break, you know, rip it up and to ruin it. I don't know if that was a regular occurrence when people got crucified, but it definitely happened in this case and it definitely fulfilled this scripture. And we see the thirst of Jesus Christ. We see him saying, I thirst, and them giving him vinegar to drink instead of giving him some water. They see him, you know, ridicule him and mocking him and, and everything that Jesus Christ went through, all of this came fulfilled to a T and was witnessed by many people and recorded and written down. Turn if you would to, um, turn if you would to Isaiah 53. I'm just going to read for you from Zechariah 12. Zechariah 12.10 says, And I will pour upon the house of David and upon the inhabitants of Jerusalem the spirit of grace and of supplications, and they shall look upon me whom they have pierced, 
and they shall mourn for him as one mourneth for his only son, and shall be in bitterness for him as one that is in bitterness for his firstborn. Again, the piercing of Jesus Christ prophesied in Zechariah 12. Isaiah 53, we're going to see more prophecies of Jesus Christ's crucifixion. Isaiah 53, verse number 1, Who hath believed our report, and to whom is the arm of the Lord revealed? For he shall grow up before him as a tender plant, and as a root out of a dry ground. He hath no form nor comeliness, and when we shall see him, there is no beauty that we should desire him. He is despised and rejected of men, a man of sorrows and acquainted with grief, and we hid, as it were, our faces from him. He was despised and we esteemed him not. How can you esteem someone that you're shouting, crucify him, crucify him, right? Of course they didn't esteem him. Of course he was despised. Of course he was rejected. That's exactly, this is what happened to Jesus Christ. Look at verse number four. Surely he hath borne our griefs and carried our sorrows, yet we did esteem him stricken, smitten of God, and afflicted. But he was wounded for our transgressions. He was bruised for our iniquities, the chastisement of our peace was upon him, and with his stripes we are healed. And we see the recording of Jesus Christ was whipped. He was beaten. He, was, he had stripes left from being whipped and beaten. He was wounded. He was bruised. Verse 6, All we like sheep have gone astray. We have turned everyone to his own way. And the Lord hath laid on him the iniquity of us all. He was oppressed and he was afflicted, yet he opened not his mouth. He is brought as a lamb to the slaughter and as a sheep before her shearers is dumb, so he openeth not his mouth. You remember when they were charging him and they were bringing accusations against him. What did Jesus do? He said nothing. He remained silent. I mean, he said one or two phrases, just, but, but he wasn't answering for himself. He wasn't defending himself. He wasn't trying to get out of anything. He just, he allowed it to happen. He let everything proceed and go forth. As a sheep before his shears is dumb, so he opened not his mouth. He knew this needed to happen. He didn't try to put up a fight or a defense. He just went along with it. Verse number eight, he was taken from prison and from judgment. And who shall declare his generation? For he was cut off out of the land of the living. For the transgression of my people was he stricken. And he made his grave with the wicked and with the rich in his death because he had done no violence. Neither was there any deceit in his mouth. Yet it pleased the Lord to bruise him. He hath put him to grief. When thou shalt make his soul an offering for sin, he shall see his seed. He shall prolong his days and the pleasure of the Lord shall prosper in his hand. He shall see of the travail of his soul and shall be satisfied by his knowledge. Excuse me, by his knowledge shall my righteous servant justify many, for he shall bear their iniquities. Therefore will I divide him a portion with the great, and he shall divide the spoil with the strong, because he hath poured out his soul unto death and was numbered with the transgressors. And he bare the sin of many and made intercession for the transgressors. He was numbered with the transgressors. He was crucified with two thieves. So he was counted being condemned with them. They were transgressors. He was not. But he was numbered with them. And it says he made intercession for the transgressors. Remember he said, um, Lord, forgive them. They know not what they do. And you also remember when the one thief you know, spake unto him, and, and he finally put his faith on Jesus. And, you know, at first he was reviling him in his lips. And then he says, you know what? We're in this situation, and, and rightfully so, because we're thieves, we're criminals. But this man hasn't done anything. And he said, Lord, remember me when thou comest into that kingdom. And Jesus said, this day shalt thou be with me in paradise. He made intercession for the truth. All of these things happened. I mean, to, to go through all the scripture and try to say, oh, you know, to, to make up every single event that happened, but yet to have it all still match up perfectly without contradiction, without fail, it is, it is above what man is capable of doing. Turn, if you would, to um, Psalm 16. Psalm 16, now we're going to look at the resurrection of Jesus. We saw his birth. We saw him coming out of Bethlehem, out of Egypt. We saw his ministry and all the, the, the miracles being prophesied. We saw his betrayal. We saw his death and his, and his crucifixion. Now we're going to look at the resurrection of Jesus Christ. We're going to look at Psalm 16 and we're going to look at Acts chapter 2. 
And this is actually a pretty important doctrine that I think has fallen by the wayside. A lot of people aren't aware of this doctrine, but it's another fulfillment of prophecy that is clear and couldn't be any clearer in Scripture. Psalm 16, look at verse number 8. I have set the Lord always before me. Because he is at my right hand, I shall not be moved. Therefore, my heart is glad and my glory rejoiceth. My flesh also shall rest in hope. For thou wilt not leave my soul in hell. Neither wilt thou suffer thine holy one to see corruption. Thou wilt show me the path of life. In thy presence is fullness of joy. At thy right hand there are pleasures forevermore. So we saw in verse 10 there, he's talking about the Holy One. He's talking about the Christ. He's talking about the Messiah. And we're going to see this explained just completely clearly in Acts chapter 2. But just looking at this psalm, he's saying, My heart's glad. My glory rejoiceth. My flesh shall rest in hope because, why? Because you will not leave my soul in hell. Amen. Now, I know this is stupid simple, but let me just say it. In order for a soul to be left in hell, it had to be there at some point in order for that sentence even to make sense, right? I mean, you can't say, God, don't leave my soul in hell if you were never there to begin with. Don't leave me there. You're not, you haven't even been there. How can I leave you there? He's saying, you, you're not going to leave my soul in hell. Acts 2 makes this very clear. Acts 2.25 this is talking about our Messiah. This is talking about Jesus Christ. This is talking about for the three days and three nights that Jesus Christ was dead after he was crucified and they put his body in a tomb that one, his flesh didn't see corruption. His flesh didn't decay. It didn't rot. But number two, his soul was in hell. He did not go to heaven when he died. As he bare the sins of the world, as he said, my God, my God, why hast thou forsaken me? And it pleased the Lord to bruise him. He didn't end up just going straight to heaven then. He bare the sins of the world and paid for our sins in hell. Backed up by scripture. Look at Acts chapter 2, verse number 25. This is, they're going to be referring to, they quote Psalm 16 and they're going to explain Psalm 16. Acts 2, 25, For David speaketh concerning him. This is what we just read. That's why it says David speaketh, because David wrote that psalm. Psalm 16. For David speaketh concerning him. I foresaw the Lord always before my face. For he is on my right hand, that I should not be moved. Therefore did my heart rejoice, and my tongue was glad. Moreover also my flesh shall rest in hope, because thou wilt not leave my soul in hell, neither wilt thou suffer thine holy one to see corruption. It's exactly what we just read. Thou hast made known to me the ways of life. Thou shalt make me full of joy with thy countenance. Men and brethren, let me freely speak unto you of the patriarch David. So let me tell you something about David. David's the one that wrote this down, right? Let me tell you something about David. That he is both dead and buried, and his sepulcher is with us unto this day. Therefore, being a prophet, and knowing that God had sworn with, it, with an oath to him, that of the fruit of his loins, according to the flesh, he would raise up Christ to sit on his throne. He, seeing this before, spake of the resurrection of Christ, that his soul was not left in hell, neither his flesh did see corruption. This Jesus hath God raised up, whereof we, are, we all are witnesses. So he's saying that, David spake this. David wrote this. He spake this psalm, but he wasn't talking about himself. I mean, you know, oftentimes you're reading through the book of Psalms and you can see how it applies in David's life. And you can see a lot of the stuff. You know, he's going to God and asking him for protection and, and he's praising God for, for never forsaking him and everything else and being there when he needs him most. And, and, but what he's explaining to us here, he's saying, you know what? This is not about David. David's sepulcher, you know, it's with us unto this day. He's dead. He's buried, you know. But he, being a prophet, and he knew that he's already been promised that Christ was going to be born according to the flesh of his loins, that, that he had that blessing upon him, that there was not going to be a ruler to fail among his seed, and that it was ultimately going to lead to the, to the one king of kings and lord of lords. 
because he knew that, it says, and being a prophet, he was able to, to preach this, and he, what he was doing was he was speaking about the resurrection of Jesus Christ, that his soul, Jesus' soul, was not left in hell. We see another evidence of this, another proof of this, besides in Acts chapter 2 and Psalm 16 in Jonah. Turn, if you would, to you look at Jonah chapter 2 and Matthew chapter 12. I'm going to start with Matthew 12 while you're turning to Jonah. Matthew 12, 39 was Jesus Christ speaking. He said, but he answered and said unto them, An evil and adulterous generation seeketh after a sign, and there shall no sign be given to it but the sign of the prophet Jonas. So he's talking about future events. He's saying there was a sign of the prophet Jonah that he gave you. He said, this is the sign that's going to happen. It's the sign from the prophet Jonah. For as Jonas was three days and three nights in the whale's belly, so shall the Son of Man be three days and three nights in the heart of the earth. The heart is in the center. Even science will tell you what's in the center of the earth. It's not that hard to figure out. We can look at volcanoes and see the magma and the fire and the brimstone that comes up and shoots up out of these volcanoes. We know that the, that the core, that the, the center of the earth, the heart of the earth, is extremely hot and is made up and consists of fire and brimstone. That's exactly what hell is. That is the description of hell. We saw in Acts chapter 2 that Jesus' soul was not left in hell. Why? Because he rose again from the dead. But we see here also, and in that account of Acts, in Acts chapter 2, it says, hey, David was a prophet, so he was speaking of future events. Well, Jesus said, you know what? Jonah was a prophet too. And when we go back and look at the book of Jonah in Jonah chapter 2, we're going to see that Jonah was a prophet also speaking of future events. Just like David, there's some of his own situation mixed in there, but he's also prophesying future events. They go hand in hand. So in Jonah chapter 2, it kind of goes back and forth. You're going to see he's talking about the seaweed being wrapped around his head and the physical him being, you know, it, being swallowed up by the whale. But then we're going to look at a couple of other verses that are not talking about Jonah. And it's very clear. I mean, you just look at the context, you can see, okay, there's something different going on here. Because like in verse number two, it says, and, sa and said, I cried by reason of mine affliction unto the Lord and he heard me. So you can say, okay, yeah, that's Jonah. He's crying unto the Lord. But then he says, out of the belly of hell cried I and thou heardest my voice. Was Jonah in hell? No, he was in the whale's belly. But he says, out of the belly of hell cried I. Why? Because he was a prophet. Why? Because he was speaking about things that were to come to pass in the future. Why? Jesus Christ himself said the sign of the prophet Jonas. As Jonah was three days and three nights in the whale's belly, which is where he was, he did not go to hell. He was in the whale's belly for three days and three nights. The son of man was three days, shall be three days and three nights in the heart of the earth. And then look at verse number six of Jonah chapter two. I went down to the bottoms of the mountains. The earth with her bars was about me forever. Yet hast thou brought up my life from corruption, O Lord my God. Again, a reference to hell. A reference to being stuck in the center of the, in the heart of the earth. The earth with her bars is about me forever. So everywhere you look, anywhere you go, you're surrounded, you're trapped, you're imprisoned in hell. I mean, the bottoms of the mountains. That was, that was Jonah being a prophet and prophesying Jesus Christ going to hell. And then, of course, three days later, rising from the dead. So these are just, this is a sampling. This is a sampling of Scripture, of Old Testament Scripture being fulfilled in the New Testament. It, I mean, we're limited, I'm limited just in general by time. But when you go through the Bible, you can see so many places that the old, I mean, if you just read the New Testament, the next time you read the, the New Testament, take a mental note of every time you run across where it's referencing the Old Testament, where it's referencing a fulfillment of a prophecy in the Old Testament, where it's saying, oh yeah, this, is, this happened because this was already said here. This was just like the prophet said here. This is just like it was already written here. See how many times it's written. And you'll see why... I didn't include all of them in my sermon because <laughs> it would just take way too long. But we see there a great illustration, just a small sampling of the birth, 
the ministry, the, the, the betrayal, the, the, you know, the death, the burial, the resurrection, all this stuff, Jesus Christ coming to pass. And coming to pass perfectly. Glory be to God. Let's bow our eyes and have a word of prayer. Dear Heavenly Father, Lord, we thank you so much for um, providing us a Savior. Dear Lord, for providing us words that we know and, and can verify. They're, they're the words of God just because of the sheer perfection and the, the fulfillment of the prophecies, dear Lord. We know that, that, it, that it must be true and that it must be from you. God, no one is capable of, of faking and staging everything that happened in happened i mean to, to go through all the scripture and try to say oh you know to, to make up every single event that happened but yet to have it all still match up perfectly without contradiction without fail it is it is above what man is capable of doing turn if you would to um, psalm 16 psalm 16 now we're gonna look at the resurrection of jesus we saw his birth we saw him coming out of Bethlehem, out of Egypt. We saw his ministry and all the, the, the miracles being prophesied. We saw his betrayal. We saw his death and his, and his crucifixion. Now we're going to look at the resurrection of Jesus Christ. We're going to look at Psalm 16 and we're going to look at Acts chapter 2. And this is actually a pretty important doctrine that I think has fallen by the wayside. A lot of people aren't aware of this doctrine, but it's another fulfillment of prophecy that is clear and couldn't be any clearer in Scripture. Psalm 16, look at verse number 8. I have set the Lord always before me. Because he is at my right hand, I shall not be moved. Therefore my heart is glad and my glory rejoiceth. My flesh also shall rest in hope. For thou wilt not leave my soul in hell. Neither wilt thou suffer thine holy one to see corruption. Thou wilt show me the path of life. In thy presence is fullness of joy. At thy right hand there are pleasures forevermore. So we saw in verse 10 there, he's talking about the Holy One. He's talking about the Christ. He's talking about the Messiah. And we're going to see this explained just completely clearly in Acts chapter 2. But just looking at this psalm, He's saying, my heart's glad, my glory rejoiceth, my flesh shall rest in hope because, why? Because you will not leave my soul in hell. Amen. Now, I know this is stupid simple, but let me just say it. In order for a soul to be left in hell, it had to be there at some point in order for that sentence even to make sense. Right? I mean, you can't say, God, don't leave my soul in hell if you are never there to begin with. Don't leave me there. You're not, you haven't even been there. How can I leave you there? He's saying, you, you're not going to leave my soul in hell. Acts 2 makes this very clear. Acts 2.25. This is talking about our Messiah. This is talking about Jesus Christ. This is talking about for the three days and three nights that Jesus Christ was dead after he was crucified and they put his body in a tomb that one, his flesh didn't see corruption. His flesh didn't decay. It didn't rot. But number two, his soul was in hell. He did not go to heaven when he died. As he bare the sins of the world, as he said, my God, my God, why hast thou forsaken me? And it pleased the Lord to bruise him. He didn't end up just going straight to heaven then. He bare the sins of the world and paid for our sins in hell. Backed up by scripture. Look at Acts chapter 2, verse number 25. This is, they're going to be referring to, they quote Psalm 16 and they're going to explain Psalm 16. Acts 2, 25, for David speaketh concerning him. This is what we just read. That's why it says David speaketh because David wrote that psalm. Psalm 16, for David speaketh concerning him, I foresaw the Lord always before my face, for he is on my right hand that I should not be moved. Therefore did my heart rejoice and my tongue was glad. Moreover also my flesh shall rest in hope because thou wilt not leave my soul in hell, neither wilt thou suffer thine holy one to see corruption. It's exactly what we just read. Thou hast made known to me the ways of life. Thou shalt make me full of joy with thy countenance. Men and brethren, let me freely speak unto you of the patriarch David. So let me tell you something about David. David's the one that wrote this down, right? Let me tell you something about David. That he is both dead and buried and his sepulcher is with us unto this day. 
Therefore, being a prophet and knowing that God had sworn with, it, with an oath to him that of the fruit of his loins according to the flesh, he would raise up Christ to sit on his throne, he, seeing this before, spake of the resurrection of Christ, that his soul was not left in hell, neither his flesh did see corruption. This Jesus hath God raised up, whereof we, are, we all are witnesses. So he's saying that David spake this. David wrote this. He spake this psalm, but he wasn't talking about himself. I mean, you know, oftentimes you're reading through the book of Psalms and you can see how it applies in David's life. And you can see a lot of the stuff, you know, he's going to God and asking him for protection and, and he's praising God for, for never forsaking him and everything else and being there when he needs him most. And, and, but what he's explaining to us here, he's saying, you know what? This is not about David. David Sepulchre, you know, it's with us unto this day. He's dead, he's buried, you know. But he being a prophet and he knew that he's already been promised that Christ was going to be born according to the flesh of his loins, that, that he had that blessing upon him, that there was not going to be a ruler to fail among his seed, and that it was ultimately going to lead to the, to the one king of kings and lord of lords. Because he knew that, it says, and being a prophet, he was able to, to preach this, and he, what he was doing was he was speaking about the resurrection of Jesus Christ, that his soul, Jesus' soul, was not left in hell. We see another evidence of this, another proof of this, besides in Acts chapter 2 and Psalm 16 in Jonah. Turn, if you would, to look at Jonah chapter 2 and Matthew chapter 12. I'm going to start with Matthew 12 while you're turning to Jonah. Matthew 12, 39 was Jesus Christ speaking, he said, but he answered and said unto them, An evil and adulterous generation seeketh after a sign, and there shall no sign be given to it but the sign of the prophet Jonas. So he's talking about future events. He's saying there was a sign of the prophet Jonah that he gave you. He said this is the sign that's going to happen. It's the sign from the prophet Jonah. For as Jonas was three days and three nights in the whale's belly, so shall the Son of Man be three days and three nights in the heart of the earth. The heart is in the center. Even science will tell you what's in the center of the earth. It's not that hard to figure out. We can look at volcanoes and see the magma and the fire and the brimstone that comes up and shoots up out of these volcanoes. We know that the, that the core, that the, the center of the earth, the heart of the earth, is extremely hot and is made up and consists of fire and brimstone. That's exactly what hell is. That is the description of hell. We saw in Acts chapter 2 that Jesus' soul was not left in hell. Why? Because he rose again from the dead. But we see here also, and in that account of Acts, in Acts chapter 2, it says, hey, David was a prophet, so he was speaking of future events. Well, Jesus said, you know what? Jonah was a prophet too. And when we go back and look at the book of Jonah in Jonah chapter 2, we're going to see that Jonah was a prophet also speaking of future events. Just like David, there's some of his own situation mixed in there, but he's also prophesying future events. They go hand in hand. So in Jonah chapter 2, it kind of goes back and forth. You're going to see he's talking about the seaweed being wrapped around his head and the physical him being, you know, it, being swallowed up by the whale. But then we're going to look at a couple of other verses that are not talking about Jonah. And it's very clear. I mean, you just look at the context, you can see, okay, there's something different going on here. Because like in verse number two, it says, and, sa and said, I cried by reason of mine affliction unto the Lord and he heard me. So you can say, okay, yeah, that's Jonah. He's crying unto the Lord. But then he says, out of the belly of hell cried I and thou heardest my voice. Was Jonah in hell? No, he was in the whale's belly. But he says, out of the belly of hell cried I. Why? Because he was a prophet. Why? Because he was speaking about things that were to come to pass in the future. Why? Jesus Christ himself said the sign of the prophet Jonas. As Jonah was three days and three nights in the whale's belly, which is where he was, he did not go to hell. He was in the whale's belly for three days and three nights. The son of man was three days, shall be three days and three nights in the heart of the earth. And then look at verse number six of Jonah chapter two. I went down to the bottoms of the mountains. The earth with her bars was about me forever. Yet hast thou brought up my life from corruption, O Lord my God. Again, a reference to hell. A reference to being stuck in the center of the, in the heart of the earth, 
The earth with her bars is about me forever. So everywhere you look, anywhere you go, you're surrounded, you're trapped, you're imprisoned in hell. I mean, the bottoms of the mountains. That was, that was Jonah being a prophet and prophesying Jesus Christ going to hell. And then, of course, three days later, rising from the dead. So these are just, this is a sampling. This is a sampling of Scripture, of Old Testament Scripture being fulfilled in the New Testament. It, I mean, we're limited, I'm limited just in general by time. But when you go through the Bible, you can see so many places that the Old, I mean, if you just read the New Testament, the next time you read the, the New Testament, take a mental note of every time you run across where it's referencing the Old Testament, where it's referencing a fulfillment of a prophecy in the Old Testament, where it's saying, oh yeah, this, is, this happened because this was already said here. This was just like the prophet said here. This is just like it was already written here. See how many times it's written. And you'll see why I didn't include all of them in my sermon. <laughs> because it would just take way too long. But we see there a great illustration, just a small sampling of the birth, the ministry, the, the, the betrayal, the, the, you know, the death, the burial, the resurrection, all this up, Jesus Christ coming to pass. And coming to pass perfectly. Glory be to God. Let's bow our eyes and have a word of prayer. Dear Heavenly Father, Lord, we thank you so much for um, providing us a Savior, dear Lord, for providing us words that we know and, and can verify. They're, they're the words of God just because of the sheer perfection and the, the fulfillment of the prophecies, dear Lord. We know that, that, it, that it must be true and that it must be from you. God, no one is capable of, of faking and staging everything that happened in the Bible. And anyone that thinks that, that this is staged is a fool. God, I pray that you would please help us to share the love and the truth of, uh, of Jesus Christ, to help us to show other people the great wisdom found in your word. Help us uh, to lead other people to that Messiah, to that Christ, to the Savior, dear Lord, that their souls might also be saved in, uh, in a Savior that loves us, dear God. In Jesus' name we pray, amen.